Support Wrestle Talk. Becky Lynch turned face. Ronda Rousey turned heel. Bailey returned. And Brock Lesnar picked up the freaking ring with a tractor. This is WWE Takeover. I.e., my review of WWE SummerSlam 2022 in about 10 minutes. Before I get into that though, please subscribe to us here at WrestleTalk and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. I'll have another video up later today with all the backstage happenings from last night's premium live event. The Triple H premium live event. Era kicked off in the most Triple H way possible. Maximize those entrances with it being a long way to the ring. Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair were first up in what felt like a poetic addressing of the wrongs of the last year of McMahon. At last year's Summerfest, Lynch returned as a heel, which the crowd never really fully bought into, and she squashed Bianca Belair for the women's title in 27 seconds, which the crowd also didn't really buy into. In fact, they f***ing hated it. After an excellent back and forth match, my favourite wrestling match on the whole show, which is different to Brock vs Roman's rather different style of fight in the main event, lest we forget the tractor, Triple H had adjusted the dynamics perfectly. Somehow not only giving Belair a great solid victory, not only turning Becky Lynch babyface, but also putting them together as a team against a returning slash debuting new faction of Bailey, Io Shirai and Dakota Kai. Screw just making NXT black and gold again. Again, let's do it for the main roster too! In a fantastic match layout, Becky kept going back to the same moves, but each time Belair would have adapted to them. So when she went for her second man slam, Bianca countered with a second rope Spanish fly into the KOD to win. Despite looking upset, Becky then shook Belair's hand and embraced her without turning heel this time. That's when Bailey's music hit for her triumphant return from injury, wearing trousers that were more pockets than leg. It turns out she needed all those compartments for all her new friends. Dakota Kai, who was released back in April, the first of the ruthless WWE cuts Triple H's regime has brought back in, suggesting he might try and do the same for others that got away, and Io Shirai, making her main roster debut. She was believed to be out the door back to Japan, with her contract expiring imminently and no creation plans on the books. Now, one of NXT's best women wrestlers over the last few years is finally on the main roster in a major story. She's also now called EO Sky, in the same way that Uber drivers sometimes just tell me their name is Dave to make it easier for me to pronounce. Why is it on me to learn how to say your name properly, Takeshita? To slightly even the odds, Becky stood by Belair's side for a stare down against Team Bick or whatever they're called. One match into Triple H's pay-per-view party, and we kind of already get an NXT invasion. There's so much goodwill towards WWE right now because of the change in management, the crowd even ended up cheering for Logan Paul against The Miz. It helps that he's an incredible athlete, not just hitting impressive high spots, but also by working admirably stiff, properly laying any strikes and kicks on the king of soft style, Miz. Paul got the win after a picture-perfect frog splash off the top rope through the announcer's desk, and AJ Styles also chased Tommaso Ciampa off from ringside, hopefully spinning off into a mouth-watering feud for the two on Raw. Before we get on with the rest of the episode, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to this video's sponsor, Raycon, who got voted best earbuds in Esquire's best gadgets of 2021. And you can now get their amazing fitness earbuds for $20 off and an extra 15% off at our special link by raycon.com forward slash wrestle talk news. Raycon's earbuds have premium sound and smart tech are developed and tested to stay in your ear even during the toughest of workouts. Or in my case, banging your head to Minoru Suzuki's entrance music. Cause I need no right! And with 54 hours of battery life, nearly double the battery life of other brands on the market, meaning I can wear mine for days before using their fancy wireless charger. Honestly, getting wireless earbuds has been one of the best improvements for my day-to-day -day life. From wearing them, cycling to work, being able to tap awareness mode on and off, taking calls, walking around hands-free, or just having noise isolation on to get into some deep work. And a lot of people agree, with 37,000 five-star reviews. 
And built with waterproof technology, they're even okay on my sweaty, sweaty head. Raycon is currently having a special fitness sale where you can get these amazing fitness earbuds for $20 off. And to make it even sweeter, my viewers get an extra 15% if you click our special link, buyraycon.com forward slash News. This is a limited time offer though, so get it now before it's gone. Get top of the line earbud functionality and high quality sound at half the price of other premium audio brands. Please do at least click the link in the video description below as every visit really helps support us at WrestleTalk. Ear that bud. Something strange happened in Bobby Lashley vs Theory. The match itself was more of a plot device than a fight. Theory wanted to keep himself fresh for a potential cash-in later. Great idea, Theory, that worked out real well for you. So he tapped to Lashley in under five minutes. Bobby looked absolutely awesome here. Now, instead, the strange feeling was more poetic than that. I can't really believe I'm about to talk the mythic resonance of a sunset in a SummerSlam review, but it's been a weird few weeks, okay? This match was when I realized the sun had set. The sky was a dark, cloudy blue, and the fans had been cast over in shadow. All of a sudden, this didn't feel like a huge main roster stadium show to me. It felt like a huge NXT takeover, complete with grungy lighting. If there was any doubt going into this show, it had been dispelled by this point. The sun really had set on the old era, and the Triple H bearded dawn was here. With it being no DQ, Judgment Day vs the Mysterios weirdly held off on weapons and interference. Ray and Balor's interactions were great, but when Rhea Ripley got involved with the heels seemingly set to win, Edge made his return from a giant staircase pulsating with flames. Oh, you really snuck up on them there, Edge. Sure, it was about a two mile walk up the ramp and Balor could have easily got a three count, but it's about revenge or, or something. Right? Edge helped the Mysterios pick up the babyface win, and still no heel turn for Dominic. This can spin very nicely into an Edge vs Balor singles feud. And I'm so happy for Edge that he left over creative disagreements not wanting to do any of that supernatural stuff, and he's returned as a vampire. While Logan Paul is probably a better professional wrestler, Pat McAfee is the perfect sports entertainer. And his match with Happy Corbin was one of the night's standouts precisely because of the deeper emotion and clear heel face dynamics dynamics at play. From the start, when McAfee interrupted Corbin's entrance with a male choir singing dumbass Corbin, through the backflips and hurricane ranas and the swanton bomb that he somehow hit despite nearly falling backwards. That's not how physics works. But the real treat here, and it was one of the underlying huge positives of this whole show, and 2010 Ollie is screaming at me for even thinking about saying this, but the landscape has changed. Michael Cole was a really good commentator. It was summed up by Corey Graves telling him, I liked it better when you weren't allowed to have an opinion. To which Michael replied, that's changed. A lot's changed. Cole cheering for his friend McAfee was the emotional highlight of this entire event, mirroring when JR would cheer for Lawler against Taz. McAfee got the win after some low blow revenge on Corbin. He is now three excellent matches out of three. He might have the highest batting average in all of wrestling. Drew McIntyre came out for a really effective promo, talking up how he's going to face the winner of the main event at Clash at the Castle, and getting the whole crowd to chant for a kid called Colt in the front row. Hey Colt the Kid, how you doing? This wasn't just a smart bit of long-term building. It was concise and expertly placed in the card to keep the overall pace zipping along. The Street Profits versus The Usos had a tough act to follow, with their Money in the Bank clash a contender for WWE Match of the Year, and they were never really given the time to surpass it, going just over half the length of their previous encounter. Instead, the drama was built around Montez Ford getting increasingly frustrated. He could have had it one after his frog splash, but he took too long recovering before making the pin. Dawkins got hit by the 1D from The Usos to retain shortly after. There was no turn here, probably for the best as it would have got lost in all the other stuff that happened on the show, but Ford looked totally dejected afterwards, potentially foreshadowing a split this week. Before you could fully comprehend Kid Rock snogging a chick at ringside, Riddle suddenly ran into the ring demanding a fight with Seth Rollins. Seth walked out with loads of officials trying to stop him and stomped an injured Riddle. This was actually a really effective angle, crucially making the WWE officials feel like a coherent babyface presence rather than the inconsistent heel swarm they usually are. Getting the shortest match on the show, Liv Morgan pinned Ronda Rousey in four and a half minutes. On paper, that sounds like incredibly strong booking of Morgan. In reality, 
it was probably the show's only misstep. Rhonda dominated Morgan, kayfabe dislocating her shoulder. She then locked on an arm bar, but Morgan got her shoulders on the mat and won. Wasn't terrible, but it wasn't good either. The strategy appears to be that no one will remember the match, because Rhonda then turned heel afterwards, but she never really went full force on that either. She somewhat attacked Liv afterwards, then beat up a referee too, which felt more badass than bad guy. This did not live up to Rhonda's heel turn potential. Thankfully, the main event overwhelmed not just its own potential and the Rhonda vs Liv match, but probably WWE's entire summer. Roman Reigns vs Brock Lesnar started absolutely incredible from the entrances, because Brock rode down in a frickin' tractor, and Ring announced himself from the digger part. He then began the match by leaping off it to rain down punches on Reigns. They had a wickedly physical match around the ring, but as Chekhov once said, if a tractor isn't going to ram the ring, it shouldn't have been driven down there at all. And that was a Russian playwright writing in the early 20th century. With Reigns in the ring, Lesnar lifted up one corner of it with the digger, hoisting it up in the air, with Roman hilariously tumbling outside. In terms of actual physical damage to Reigns, it, I'm pretty sure it did nothing, but in pure spectacle, this was an all-time great pro wrestling visual. The freakish love child of the Lesnar vs Big Show ring collapse angle and Stone Cold's beer truck. And it will sit alongside both of them in all of history to come. I honestly felt like I was watching me breaking a video game, where I'd somehow managed to use a bit of SmackDown 3's environment that wasn't supposed to work that way. It felt like they broke wrestling. Ultimately though, everything conspired against Lesnar. Theory tried to cash in his briefcase, but it was never sanctioned. Heyman got put through a table, leaving the Usos and Reigns to literally bury Brock under debris to get the last man standing win. And disappointed, they did not also use Heyman's body. This was an all-time great piece of sports entertainment and a far more fitting end to their feud than the limp WrestleMania conclusion. What did you think of SummerSlam 2022? Let me know in the comments. We didn't get a single title change, but there's still feels like an absolutely epic show. Returns, heel turns, face turns, star turns, and a freaking tractor. This is the best version of sports entertainment. Maybe it's just the optimism in the air, but hot damn, for me, SummerSlam 2022 is the best pay-per-view of the year at 95%. Now check out Luke's immediate reactions to the show. That was probably the most insane spot you have ever seen in a professional wrestling match and likely will ever see in a professional wrestling match.